and steal our idea. And we fool them. We're meeting inside. So uh, we got a testimony right before our next preacher. And uh, Brandon Ashby, if you would come on up here, brother. Share with us what God has laid on your heart. Alrighty, if you haven't heard, my name is Brandon Ashby, and uh, if you can't tell through these devilishly good looks, I have cancer. Um, if you would, take your Bibles really quick and turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. This is a pretty popular verse, a lot of people know it. A lot of people have heard it, but very few really know just how in how deep this verse goes. Even I don't know, and I'm learning more and more about it. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Well, from right there, from verse 5 to really verse 8, I had down to verse 9, Mark, but verse 9 had more tithe, but still. Verse 5 to verse 8, it says, Trust in the Lord, the very first word, trust. Now, we all know the definition. We can look it up in the dictionary. Many of us who are Christians, we hear about trusting in the Lord. We hear about putting everything we have in Him, putting our faith in Him, putting all our hopes in, into the Lord and living, living our lives for Him every day and giving all our worries to Him. But how many of us really understand the concept of trusting the Lord? It sounds simple, but in our walk of faith as Christians, it can be one of the hardest things to do. And if you're not saved, putting your faith and trust in, as, they would, as the world would say, a God or a being who has or hasn't been proven seems ridiculous. It's not. It's something you feel. It's something that's personal. It's something that grows every day, and that's my testimony. Growing up, um, I hear a lot of people talk about how they had, they didn't really come from a, a religious family or a family who went to church or a family who believed. They didn't grow up reading the Bible. Maybe they had a relative who took them to church every now and then, um, but they didn't really know God until they came to know him on their own later in life. For me, it wasn't like that. Uh, my mom and my dad always made sure that me and David were in church. They always made sure that we were at Sunday school. Uh, we used to live in Michigan before we lived here in, in uh, New Mexico, which is where Ken's family's from. And in Michigan, there was a uh, homeless, I believe like a homeless shelter called Mel Trotters, where Ken would pick up me and David. We're just tiny little guys, like this little girl here tiny. We could just barely talk. And he already had us memorizing scriptures and rem memorizing songs. And um, he would put us up on the pulpit and we'd recite it for all the, the, the audience to hear. And they'd clap and they'd cheer. And it was fun. And it was, to many of them, I'm sure, it was probably encouraging to see little children, you know, quoting the Bible. But that was my life. I was in church all the time. I, I was in Sunday school all the time. I heard all the stories. I heard all the Bible verses. I sang all the songs. And when I got older, I went and started attending adult services, started sitting in the pews, listening to the pastors, looking in the Bible. I attended Good News Baptist uh, Academy. Um, you know, I was, I was always in church. And I never understood the concept of getting saved because... You know, my dad would go soul witnessing uh, in Michigan on the weekends, and we'd go up, and it was almost like a routine. I'd see him talk to people, 
you know, ask if they knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, ask if they knew, um, if they went to church or did this or did that. And he'd say, did you know, do you know for that if you were to die today, that you would go to heaven? Standard question. Everyone, some people would say yes, some people would say I, no, some people would say I don't know, say I hope so. You get all the different answers. And then he said, well, do you mind if I show you how you can be sure? And he'd take them through the gospel, the Romans Road, the ABCs. And for me, I didn't, I was young and I was young and he always took me with him, but I didn't understand what these words were. I didn't, it was all just church. It was the same stuff to me. And I never understood what it meant. Um, just that there was a man named Jesus. He died on the cross and he loved me, which is the gospel and that he wants me to go to heaven. But the depth of it, I didn't understand until later when I was an adult. And so um, at first, for my very big portion of my life, I thought I was saved. I thought I was a Christian. I thought I was going to heaven because I had said a prayer several years ago. I had said a prayer that I heard many other people say. Almost word for word. I had said a prayer, a routine prayer. Um, and I thought that's what made me saved. But um, it wasn't the case. There was a couple years ago, probably about six years ago. It, it's hard for me to remember. I've had some brain issues. Um, about six, I believe it was about six years ago, six, seven years ago. Uh, Brother Walt Summers was here and he was preaching. And... The, less, the sermon that he was preaching on was about being saved and what it meant to be saved. Being saved doesn't, doesn't mean you, you, you say a prayer and you say a certain uh, number of words or you say a certain whatever and suddenly you're saved. It's not, that's not what it is, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's a change of heart. It's a decision that you yourself personally make. That you're going to leave your life that you once had to yourself and you're going to surrender it and live a life for God. And it's a change. There's a physical change. There's a chemical change. There's a spiritual change. Everything changes when you get saved. And this, it all hit me when I was sitting in the, in the pews. And when Brother Walt was, was preaching, it hit me. And I realized I wasn't saved. It's just been so camouflaged in front of me all my years because, I, like I said, I'd been in church. I knew all the Bible verses. I knew all the songs. I knew all the stories. I knew that there was a man who got swallowed by a great fish. I knew there was a man who built an ark. I knew, that, I knew all the stories. But it camouflaged my salvation or what I thought was my salvation. So after service, I came up and I talked to Brother Walt. I said, I need to get saved. I'm not saved. I thought I was. I thought I had everything. I thought I had all my ducks lined up. I thought I had everything ready. I thought I had every. I thought I did everything right, and I did, according to to the 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 routine of what everyone thinks you need to do. But inside, there wasn't anything. Nothing changed. I was still a, a, like I was still lost, and I just couldn't see it. So I told Brother Walt, "So I need to get saved. I need to." I need to be say I need to 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 make a change. I need to make that decision for reals. And so he sat me down right here in the front row. And once again, I was expecting to say another prayer, like he was going to tell me what to say. And he said, "No, I'm not telling you what to say. There is nothing to say. This is between you and God. No pastor on earth has ever saved a soul. It's Jesus who saves the souls. The pastor's job is to lead them to Christ." Is to show them the path, but it's God who ultimately saves your soul. It's God, it's Jesus who died on the cross. It wasn't Brother Morgan, it wasn't Brother Rome, it wasn't Brother Randy, it wasn't Brother Nick, none of them. Not one single pastor has ever saved a soul. It's God who saves a soul. It's God who will rescue you. And so Brother Walt told me, he says, This is what you need to do. Realize that you are a sinner. Realize that you have messed up. Realize that. Because of what you've done, hell is what you deserve. Hell is your reward. Hell is your sentencing. But God has offered you a gift. And now it's time for you to decide whether you're going to accept that gift or leave it alone. Keep walking. So this is a decision you need to make personally with you and God. 
So I taught, and I, so it wasn't, it wasn't a, 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 a word that he told me to say or a prayer. It was me opening myself up personally, coming before God and saying, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry that I knew about all this this whole time. And yet I, had, I didn't know about it at all. I learned about it. I heard about it, but I didn't know about it. I didn't get the meaning. It flew over my head. I'm sorry that it took me so long to realize that I was just kidding myself, that I was lying to myself. Lord, I'm sorry. And I know I'm not worthy. I know I'll never be. I know that no matter how much I try, I'm, I can't get anywhere. Please help me. Please change my life. Please take control. Because I have no control. For those of you who think you're in control of your life and you don't have God in your you're not in control. You're spinning in a circle and you're going down fast. You just don't see it. Lord, please help me. Please come into my life and change me. Please, I need you. And the Lord came in and he saved me. And he helped me. And here's the second part of my testimony. I was happy. I am happy. The Lord is my Savior, and I know if anything should happen to me. If I, if I was to close my eyes tonight or the next second and I pass away, I know where I'm going. And I can say that without a doubt. But here's the second half. Like Miss Heaven said, in her testimony, being a Christian's not easy. Everyone has the misconception that when you become a Christian, life becomes easy. Suddenly, everything's perfect. Suddenly, everyone's friendly. Suddenly, you're friendly. Suddenly, all this stuff goes away. Suddenly, you're wanting for to drink. You're wanting to do drugs. All this stuff suddenly magically disappears. And all those things you did in your past... They're forgiven. Don't get me wrong. They are forgiven. You are justified when you become a Christian. But the devil likes to take those things and poke you with them. He likes to remind you with them. He likes to make sure that you don't forget them. And he'll look for any and every opportunity to tie you down with them as much as he can. Because if you've gone and got them upset, you got the victory. He'll never have your soul. He will never take control of your life again unless you let him. So he's mad. He's not going to leave you alone. He's going to push the fire even further into you. He's going to push you closer to depression, to anxiety. He's going to push you closer to that past sin you had. And let me tell you, it does get rough. So I got saved. And um, a while later, I met the love of my life, and I, we got married, 2018. This past January was our fourth year of marriage, and, um, and I still look good. <laughs> a few months later, I was that same year, in June, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I'm not going to go into the whole long spiel of every detail. I'll just tell you that I had cancer. That I got cancer. I went through chemo. Went through like now this past June 6th, it has been officially four years that I've been fighting it. I've gone through nine surgeries, uh, two transplants, and four chemo treatments. And um, in the beginning. They said with the first chemo treatment that I had a 98% chance cure rate. 98%, that's really good. In school, that's an A, A+. Plus. And so I went through the chemo, and it didn't work. And then they told me that I could try doing a transplant, which has a one in third chance of curing. And it didn't work. I went through two transplants. It didn't work. 
And for a while there, I was trying to get a job in Lumberton to be a new meter reader. For those of you who know a gentleman named Lester, he's an elderly Mangani guy. He was doing it for a long time, and he, need, he just couldn't do it no more. He needed someone to, to step in. So I applied for the job. And he was showing me the ropes, and he was showing me how to, how to do the job and where the meters were, where all the houses were, what the different sections were that needed to get done, just everything. And I was getting pretty good at it, you know. And I, was, I liked being able to work again because through this whole chemo thing, all I do is sit home and do nothing. So I was happy to be able to do something again. Well, one day, um, I drove up to the house in my truck. And this is from my point of view. I drove up to the house in my truck. All I remember, I didn't turn it off. I opened my door. That's all I remember. Next thing, I'm waking up in a hospital. It seemed like 15 seconds, literally 15, 10 seconds, not even Mississippi seconds, just one, two, three, real quick. Next thing, I'm waking up in a hospital. I have cords, wires hanging out of me. I have a ventilator that I freak out. I'm tied down. I bust out of it. I pull my ventilator out, which hurt. And I'm freaking out. And I don't know what's going on. A bunch of nurses and a doctor runs into the, to the, to the room. I don't know who they are. It's just dark figures to me. The room's dark. They hold me down and calm me down. And uh, I'm panicking and I'm saying, where, where am I? What's going on? What, what's happening? And doctor, the doctor waits for me to call me. He says, Mr. Ashby he says, you're in San Juan Hospital. Um, I said, San Juan ho Hospital? I was just in my truck. How did, how did I, how did I get, th what? Mr. Ashby, you, you, I'm here to tell you, you had, you suffered some seizures. I said, seizures? What do you mean? Seizures, seizures. I had a friend who had epilepsy and I've unfortunately seen from that perspective what someone goes through in a seizure. And my mind couldn't comprehend, I had seizures? I was just in my truck. Mr. Ashby, you've been in the hospital for almost four days and you were unresponsive for almost 30 something hours. I couldn't understand what was going on. Later, when I had my mind a little bit more intact, they told me that I had a brain tumor. Up to that point, my cancer was actually going pretty well. The chemo was bringing it down. The counts were coming down. And then this happens. I find out my cancer moved to my brain. And now I have a tumor. It's still right here. And as far as I know, that's the only one. As far as I know. I panicked. I freaked out. I got scared. I told my wife. Well, I didn't have to tell her. She knew everything now. And... Honestly, I still can't remember a lot of that day. It happened so quick, ladies and gentlemen. I was in my truck. Ten seconds later, I'm in the hospital for four days. Let me tell you something. We are not promised the next second. We are not promised the next moment. Fifteen seconds, and I was in the hospital. And they said, my wife was the one who found me in my truck. And called, the, and called 911. She, she found me and they said if she had waited maybe a minute, I would have been dead. 15 seconds to me, ladies and gentlemen, was four days in a hospital. 15 seconds. Literally a second. One second, I'm in my truck, close my eyes, open it in a hospital. One second. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are not saved tonight, really think about your life. I don't care if you've been in church all your life, if you've told everyone you're a Christian all your life, and then you're now you realize you're not and you're just too embarrassed. Forget the embarrassment, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you do in this moment, because that next moment is not promised. God's allowing you to breathe right now. Take that breath and think about it yourself. Think about your life and your family. Think about where you're going to be 
They always tell you in school, well, where do you picture yourself in the next five years? Where do you picture yourself in the next X amount of years of your life? Well, let me tell you one more thing. Yesterday, I talked to Brother Morgan and the men of the church. I just got, I've been waiting this whole week to talk to my doctor, and he told me, he finally got a hold of me yesterday. Last week when I was in chemo, um, my cancer levels spiked again. They were coming down once again with the chemo, but they spiked to 1,000. They were at 250, now they're at 1,000. He thought it was a mistake. He sent in to get retested. The results came back the same. And now we know pretty much that my cancer itself has mutated to a point that chemo no longer affects it. So basically, I'm out of options, according to the doctors. Basically, I have nothing left on the table. We've tried everything. And that's why I was wanting to share that verse, trust in the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Because I made a decision a long time ago. And if you want to see my testimony on YouTube, you can. I say the same thing in there. I had to come to a realization in my life. I, I'd love, don't get me wrong, I'd love to be cured. And I'm praying every day, and my wife is, that I can get cured. But just from, I'm going to leave you with this, that I made a decision. As much as I pray for God to heal me and cure me, even if it is in his will that I don't be cured, if it's God's decision that I not be healed of this cancer, I'm still going to love and serve him. I don't know how long I have left, but whatever time I do have, it's still going to him. I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to get upset. I'm trying not to be scared and worried right now. I really am not stressing me and my wife out. So I ask for your prayers, not just for me, but for her. But no matter what, I'm still going to love and serve God. Thank you.